Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lecture 11 of uh, English 2105, British Literature from its earliest beginnings to 1700. So we're nearing the end of the course. Uh, our last, um, last work that we're studying, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. So in this lecture, we're going to do a bit of background work uh, in terms of ex exploring <clears throat> both the background of of Milton's life and, and his political involvements a little bit, as well as um, a, a little bit more fully, uh, the background of Milton's work in the epic genre. So in understanding some of the works in that genre that preceded uh, Milton's Paradise Lost and how he, let's say, innovatively plays with that genre uh, to some extent. Um, uh, I think that will be all we'll have time to do within the first um, uh, hour or hour and a half of this lecture. I hope in the next lecture to talk about uh, books one and two, uh, concentrating on um, how we interpret this question of, of uh, Satan, say, is Satan the hero, is, or are we meant as, as readers to be drawn to that rhetoric of Satan? and then realize uh, the, that it was only our fallen nature that we share with Adam and Eve, the subject of the poem. It's only our fallen nature that uh, allowed us to think that uh, a, a figure such as Satan was, uh, was so appealing, okay? So without further ado, I'm going to call up um, a, a PowerPoint presentation to, to guide us through the discussion. Okay, so as I said, we'll start with the uh, background of his life, uh, the, the epic genre, and this uh, section is called Conventions as Liberating. I'll, I'll talk about Milton's use of conventions in such a way that these poetic conventions are a way of freeing him to, to express more fully uh, what he wants to say. They're not in any way binding him, so to speak. And then uh, in the, probably in the next lecture, we'll get to those next two items, uh, looking at book one and book two. Uh, here's where we are situated in our, uh, our course in terms of the timeline of literary periods. Uh, Milton uh, is, he lived during this period, this Commonwealth uh, period of 1649 to 1660. Uh, Paradise Lost itself was uh, written, published during the Restoration, so just after that, but uh, he's, uh, he's often still studied within this, uh, this framework of, of the Renaissance and, and that period. So, some background to, to Milton's life. You can see the, his uh, years, years uh, during which he flourished there. Um, at an early age, 30 years old, I, I think that's, that's early, uh, he proclaimed himself the future author of a great English epic. And he uh, promised to create a poem devoted to the heroism of Arthur, so a, a legendary English hero. And this would be very much in the tradition of epics, is to pick a, a national kind of legendary hero and, 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 and write something that, that unites many of the the, the myths, the, 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 the cultural understandings of that, that nation or culture in and around that story. So what we have, we have here is, is less this type of national epic than, than something that's more universal. So, um, and rather than the martial heroism, uh, kind of victory of a king slash knight, uh, we, we have uh, a different type of heroism, one could say, that's celebrated in Paradise Lost. So um, from 1632 to 37, he, he undertook a period of intense study. So he, he felt that the poet needed, uh, uh, that, that the poet had a great duty of res or responsibility to know and transmit what they could of the, of the tradition. Um, and, and know all they can. And the poet is, is, is this type of divine prophet. Uh, 1640 to 42, write some early poems, 
consciously patterning himself after the career of of Virgil. So Virgil wrote his his eclogues, these pastoral poems, then these Georgics, uh, these lyrics about um, agricultural life, uh, farming, and then epic. It was only it was only after kind of being apprentice some apprentice work, so to speak, in these other genres that one could tackle epic later in life. And, and Edmund Spencer, another Renaissance author, consciously patterned his poetic career similarly on that. Um, 1642 to 1660 is this, this period of, we talked a bit about this period during our introduction to the Renaissance. I'll just remind you that, that, that England went through uh, a period of civil war and then eventually in 1649 to 60 was under a Commonwealth government. Uh, a kind of a trial in Republican form of rule. They had deposed their king. Uh, Milton was a staunch Republican. So he, he's involved in these civil wars. He's involved in, as a secretary in the Republican government, headed by Cromwell in 1649. Um, he's, uh, this, this government had, had Puritan leaning, so kind of a, a radical, uh, radical, uh, extreme of, of Protestant denial of, of certain of, uh, of Catholicism's icono, uh, icono, um, icon driven worship, <laughs> drawing a blank on that word. Um, and uh, his, his, during this period we have uh, a lot of his polemical prose. So he writes during this period uh, treatises on church government and how that needs to be limited uh, on divorce. So, so, uh, so often uh, the church would 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 regulate that divorce and you know prohibit this. He's saying that uh, uh, that two free beings need to be able to divorce if they're uh, under certain conditions, which is. It's a fairly radical claim at that time on education, on the freedom of the press. So Areopagitica, kind of a timely statement now, this kind of freedom of speech and freedom of the press is uh, kind of a topical debate now, um, in, uh, in, in especially in, in the United States. Um, but his, his Areopagitica is a real defining statement of, that, of, of this notion of freedom of the press and speech. Regicide on, on when regicide is just, so we had to justify the regicide of, 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 of Charles, as well as Republican, uh, Republicanism. So he goes blind in 1652 and dives into despair. So maybe he'll never be able to, to complete the great epic he, he thought. Um, sonnet 19, we won't read it. It's, uh, so it's a short sonnet, uh, as uh, the other sonnets we read. Uh, and uh, you might want to um, check that out. Uh, and there we get glimpses of this notion that, you know, and I consider how my light is spent, how one interpretation of that line is how I've lost my vision, my light, and how this, this could mean that I'm not able to fulfill a certain duty he thought he had to kind of share a, a divine word. Um, and then, so when he considers these things, the, the solution to that poem is, you know, that there's, there's some people who lead armies, there's some people that do this, but there are also those who serve who only stand and wait. So those who patiently wait for kind of a divine calling or sign or, or, to, or to do the right thing in the right moment, it's not necessarily the type of uh, proactive, uh, aggressive action, martial valor that that, that one nurse normally associates with heroism. And maybe this is the type of redefinition of heroism that we could see in Paradise Lost. So the period 1660 to 74 is a period in which he, he writes uh, his great poem, so Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, um, a shorter epic, uh, um, and Samson Agonistes. So it's a, about the, the, the biblical character uh, Samson. Before we begin, I want to kind of do a, a bit of an overview of what happens in this epic. Okay, so, so, uh, and I've put it in on the left in the order in which 
it ha uh, the events happen basically chronologically. On the right is the, the book number uh, or the book Roman numeral uh, in which the, that event is described to us. So one of the features we'll talk about in Epic is that the, 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 the ordering of the events, the narrative ordering of the events, how the narration orders what, uh, let's say, normal chronological time is unique. So there's a beginning, what's called in the midst of things, in medias res. So you, you're thrust into the middle of things and then you're told about previous events earlier and then there's often a projection of events that that uh, that uh, will will happen much later so uh, so time itself begins with um, Satan's rebellion so before that there's this kind of timelessness under which so first of all <laughs> let me back up and say this is kind of the well, not kind of, it is the Judeo-Christian myth, uh, mythology and stories that are presented in, in, the, in, in, in the Christian Bible and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and to some extent the Hebrew Bible, except for the, the concluding parts that we, we see here, uh, which were added by Christians. Um, the, uh, and Milton builds, of course, layers of mythology on that, but the basic structure of mythology is the is the Judeo-Christian mythology of of uh, God, um, you know, surrounded by um, a uh, uh, different orders of angels uh, for all of eternity, or that that preceded time as we know it, know it, and um, Satan, this one of these angels, uh, or Lucifer, comes by different names, and we'll talk about, a bit about the history of our conceptions of Satan a little bit later, um, uh, revolts and uh, draws a third of the angels with him. So there are very oblique references that have been interpreted as this story in Revelation, so the last book of the New Testament, the Christian New Testament has oblique references to that that has been interpreted through Christian tradition as referring to a, a, a battle of these angels in heaven that preceded creation. So, so time begins in, 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 in Milton's uh, mythological universe with Satan's rebellion. That's described in book five. So Raphael is at this point from book five to eight, giving, a, giving Adam and Eve a bit of a, bit of a history of the universe and the cosmos up until their point. And uh, this is where, where, where uh, all things began. There is a resulting war in heaven that is um, described in book six. Very interesting book if you have time to read that. Uh, uh, just, you know, these angels are fighting and they can't harm one another, right? They're, they have this kind of eternal, uh, this eternal and immortal substance. So they're hurling mountains at one another. Uh, Satan invents cannon. Uh, that does, you know, that kind of confuses them for a bit, but they're fine. So it, it seems like this pointless fighting in the end. And the sun, so God, uh, another kind of aspect of the divine being is the sun who. Uh, becomes Jesus when when it's uh, you know, God made man in the form of Jesus Christ, um, and uh, the Son is is given the the authority by by God the Father to to finally end it. He goes and dispels these angels, and they they fall over the the wall of heaven, and uh, and fall uh, to their their ultimate prison in um, in hell. Okay, so the war in heaven described in book six. Book seven describes creation. So at that event, with, with the, the rebellion and the war in heaven, it, that is a, a basically simultaneous with the creation of the cosmos. Before that, there's just the spiritual existence in heaven uh, with, with, with God uh, and, and these, these heavenly beings that uh, are also eternal and immortal. Um, 
then the events that uh, the epic opens with in book one, the awakening of the fallen angels, that is, is, happens after the creation. They hold a consultation in hell. So the, the, the angels wake up and basically they, you know, they're kind of saying, well, it's really, you know, it's no good that we're in this burning lake, you know, and let's try to get ourselves off this lake, first of all. And they go over to the, the shore of the lake and it's basically burning sulfur. It's not much better there. You know, this is no good. We were in heaven. Why did we mess that up? Now we're, we're, we're locked here for eternity. And, and so they, uh, under the leadership of Satan, they say, well, let's get, get together and, and maybe consult on different options. So they build what's called pandemonium. So pandemonium is, is all demons or on all devils. So they build a grand hall, grander than any human, human building or, or, or architectural, uh, architectural monument ever built. And, um, very easily they do this and uh, they consult in book two on their various options. What is resolved is that uh, uh, Satan will, uh, he, he puts out there, well, I've heard this other place that's going to be created called the earth and these other creatures called humans. Why don't we go over there and take that place over since we can't take heaven over. And he goes, he leaves, uh, uh, hell and like a conquering hero to some extent but we there are often references to how how we should look at that with a grain of salt and that that he uh, he isn't really what he's cut out uh, cut out to be there this consultation in hell is mirrored by a consultation in heaven where um where where god s says oh look at satan over there you know the him and the sun are looking out over the walls of heaven going, oh, you know, check this guy out. He's flying around through chaos, trying to, trying to stir up trouble. What do we, uh, what are we going to do with this character? And uh, so, uh, so God predicts that man will fall. Humans will fall. They will disobey, um, disobey, uh, the, the divine prohibition from eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And we'll to back to that in a second. And uh, he, uh, because of that, they will have, they will become mortal. There will be a lot of consequences to this. They will, and they will fall under Satan's power. So Satan is this, uh, you know, obviously this, this uh, kind of spiritual, spiritual representative of all, all that is, takes us away from the divine, take, takes us, turns us away to, to, to things that are not divine and, and, and leads us to misery, okay? So kind of a, let's say, a symbolic representation for all those things. So humanity will fall, God predicts, to Satan's power, to the power of turning away from the divine. And uh, what's to be done? He says, well, the, I, I said that the, there's that one prohibition and it would it would be mortal to taste that it would mean death. So we will we will need to have a death for that death. Someone will have to trade their life for and, and save humans. And this is kind of this is kind of the essence of the myth around. And I say myth just because I mean it's a story. Okay, it's part of the story. Not in the sense that uh, if you are religious, I'm not trying to be religious or anti-religious. I'm just saying it's part of the the trappings of the narrative around the story of Christ, okay? That's something important to remember as we go through Paradise Lost here. Uh, we're we're, we're going to study it as a literary work. So as I described these, um, the, the background here, I'm not, uh, not uh, this is not to be seen as, as preaching or if I'm pointing out the, nor the opposite, nor am I trying to, if I'm pointing out the literary backgrounds of the, of the biblical story. I'm not trying to undermine someone's beliefs. Okay, so let's keep the, let's say, spiritual beliefs aside for the moment. <coughs> now, um, so uh, we have this consultation in heaven. Who can, God says, we need to trade a life for that life. Uh, so, so the sun, uh, Kind of the angels are silent. Well, the angels, nobody's raising their hand, and and the sun says, "Yeah, I can do that." No and uh, and uh, so uh, 
there's jubilation in heaven and he will be the real savior. So around book three, we start to see the real savior. Part of the question will be, of course, in book three, like book three, I didn't put, ask you to read it because quite frankly, it's compared to the other stuff, we, we have to make choices. Like I think the whole work is great. As I mentioned in the last lecture, um, I think this is the greatest probably li single literary work ever written. Um, and the, and, and, and every piece is gold, but if, I'm going to ask you to read a couple books in terms of just the what what engages a reader is are the scenes with Satan. Satan is engaging, you know, uh, and 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 God is presented in a very boring and uh, kind of headmaster kind of a headmaster type way, you know, scolding the a scolding uh, uh, rational uh, old old fuddy duddy, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> So that that is the question uh, around uh, what we're to make of this poem, and I'll talk about a couple of approaches. So the consultation in heaven that uh, occurs, Satan arrives in paradise. That's the next event. So he had journeyed from hell. He goes up to uh, uh, through through the solar system, uh, arrives at uh, arrives on Earth, uh, and, and ultimately paradise. And um, and uh, in that book, so that's presented before he he, he uh, wanders around, overhears Adam and Eve. So it's our first presentation of Adam and Eve. And I asked you to read that book for that reason, is we get kind of a glimpse of uh, of Milton's view of humanity in its innocence, so to speak. Um, and this uh, is is let's say an extrapolation. This part of it, okay. So all this that I just described. Milton's extrapolating from different traditions of, of angels, of, of fallen angels. Um, none of this is really articulated as a, uh, as a full story in, in the biblical source. Some of it in traditions afterwards, but, um, uh, uh, and some of it is, is Milton's edition. Now we get to Adam and Eve, of course, so I'm assuming most of you have heard of that story. This is based on the first book of the Hebrew Bible and of the, the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, uh, and, and it, uh, described in books uh, in Genesis chapters two and three of the very, in very, you know, very cryptic and, um, and terse uh, 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 verses of, of this creation of, 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 of the man and the woman, their one, uh, their one uh, prohibition not to eat of the, they could, they're in this paradise and they can do, do as they wish. Uh, they can, uh, all of the fruits of the trees are there for them, except they're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and of course, the serpent comes along, tempts them, they do, okay? So Milton builds up the story around that. So all we get in the Bible is, is that little bit. And then book four, we see them, you know, how they met and what their feelings were. And they, they have discussions and Satan's overhearing this. And he plants a dream in Eve's, um, in Eve while she's sleeping, uh, uh, a disturbing dream. And, and finally, he's, he's caught by some angels that are guarding paradise. Mind, mind you, you know, it was pretty late that they caught this guy, like the security regime in paradise has a lot, leaves a lot to be desired, so to speak. Um, and and uh, that's how book four ends. Five, book five, God sends Raph, Raphael to Adam to reveal the cosmic history that led them up to this point. Because they're concerned, what was this dream about? You know, I thought things were going well, this existence seemed to be pretty good here in this paradise. And then all of a sudden, Eve has this disturbing dream, and and uh, Raphael says, "Okay, well, God sent me to you know explain a few things. There's this, you know, this the Satan guy rebelled. There was a war in heaven. So he recounts cosmic history up until that point, and and that's what occurs through books uh, five uh, to eight. Okay, um, the fall of Adam and Eve is." Uh, occurs in book nine. Now I asked you to book, read book nine. Uh, it's uh, rightly famous. Uh, so the description of 
what tempts them, the effects of the fall, how they, they turn from this mutual love to mutual recrimination and blame and selfishness. And um, even, even more important, we didn't, I didn't ask you to read it as well, and hopefully we'll have a chance to look at it though, is, is uh, the scenes in book 10 where they reconcile. So the kind of the ultimate message is we're all in this fallen condition and we need to, uh, we need to turn to one another in a spirit of mutual love as opposed to uh, kind of this ego-centered blaming of another and, 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 and trying to build up one's defenses in an argument and, and, you know, it's not my fault, your fault. And, and, and that's the kind of argument that they were, they were immediately fell under when they, when, when they fell in book nine and, and the beginning of book 10. And ultimately, um, uh, Eve begins this process of reconciliation by, 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 by humbly going over and saying, you know, I'm sorry, and, and let's work it out together. And, and, uh, um, and that's, in some ways, I, an argument can be made that Eve becomes the, the hero of the story. Okay, becomes very important in that kind of that ultimate message of of, of what does save uh, save the situation. So the consequences of the fall are described in book ten, and then remember how I described we begin in the middle, and then we also have a vision of the future. Often, so the, Michael, uh, another uh, angel, is sent down to reveal because you know they're in a, still in a bit of despair. You know, the consequence, even though they've reconciled, they go, yeah, but. What, what did we do? And Michael reveals the future and that how, how ultimately, you know, after, and in, let me back up. So through, in those books that he reveals the future, he basically reveals um, uh, the history of well, is Israel as revealed in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, he reveals how, uh, how, uh, Christ eventually um, comes to um, to uh, to save humanity, and then uh, uh, alludes to the final days and, and, and the final judgment that that's uh, described at the end of the Bible. So we have um, in this epic we have. Uh, as, as Northrop Fry says, it's the story of all things, the story of the beginning and end of time as understood in a Christian uh, framework. Um, and uh, it's good to keep that in mind. That's why I'll, I'll refer to this slide quite a bit, just to say, okay, this is where we are in terms of the cosmic history that Milton's assuming we know and how it's presented uh, in the midst of things, where we find ourselves is, is we just is, is something we just need to keep in mind. <clears throat> so this uh, this work uh, uh, has has had a history of reception that's important to keep in mind. I, so in the 18th century, so basically right after it was published, um, so it was published in the late uh, 17th century, of course, and then in the 18th century the the, the main response was to see, it, well, the main response was to see it in religious terms and political terms, but the political terms were that because Satan is, is akin to a Republican who revolts against a, a monarch or an imperial ruler, God, then, um, and because we, we are meant to question Satan and, and despise Satan, uh, people felt, well, maybe Milton had renounced his Republican leanings, okay? Um, <clears throat> in, during the Romantic period, there's a uh, kind of a, a recognition of, a growing recognition of Milton's place in the English canon that Coleridge said he sat with Shakespeare on, quote, one of the two glory-smitten summits of the poetic mountain. And I think that's true. Like, I think if you just had to pick two two authors those, those would probably be the biggest ones in terms of their stature within the tradition and affect on other authors etc and then there's a <clears throat> also a growing sense with the romantic poets and, and authors and in that period and, and critics 
there's this growing sense that maybe Satan is the hero of the poem, that there's this appeal. And that, we don't have time to go into that, but that's tied into a lot of the uh, base assumptions with uh, romantic thought and, um, and poetry. And when I say romantic, that's a literary uh, cultural period, not, not necessarily just the romantic, like romantic comedy that has to do with kind of young couples. It has to do with um, kind of a certain sense of uh, the, the calling of poetry and vision, the visionary aspect of poetry, that type of thing. Um, so for instance, William Blake, uh, one of the early romantics said, uh, and, and this, I think this is in the, the exam, final exam question. So, so uh, this, this notion of the, I would call it the satanic reading of Clairvay's Lost, the satanic reading, i.e. that we are to sympathize with Satan. Okay, that, that's what I would call the satanic reading of Paradise Lost. And then what I call the orthodox reading is, is the reading that Milton's intention and what we're supposed to get from the poem is more of an orthodox religious message. And it's not about, about seeing the appeal of Satan, the appeal of evil, so to speak. So, so William Blake was, was certainly in this satanic camp, right? So he sees the poem as really a celebration of Satan and what Satan represents. Now Blake's coming at this from a Gnostic background, so it's a, it's a particular take on on on, on the Bible that that sees um, that sees uh, God as as God that's worshipped in the Bible as as really a, as a demon. Right. Uh, um, the reason what Milton wrote in Fetters when he wrote of angels and God and at liberty when of devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it, okay? So that, that claim has, is in the background of a lot of interpretation right now. It's, uh, it's something he tossed out there in, in, in Marriage of Heaven and Hell, uh, his poem, it's a, one of his poems. It's not, a, it's not a work of criticism, but it is, it, that vision has a, a lasting influence. And it's even in the, as we'll see in the 20th century, there have been debates going back and forth on, okay, well, is this like, a, these are my terms, is, is this an orthodox or a satanic poem? So the orthodox Milton, I think uh, C.S. Lewis is a good defender of this. So people may know C.S. Lewis, he's, um, well, he's a, I mentioned him before, I think when I talked about the allegory of love, for, for courtly love, yeah. So he's um, he was a, an exceptional critic of medieval and Renaissance literature, in addition to being the author of the, the Nar Narnia Chronicles. Okay. So he has an excellent book on Milton called The Preface to Paradise Lost, and uh, a good defense there, I would say, of the orthodox view. And then William Empson is a good 20th century proponent of the, of the view that we are to see in, 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 in Satan, uh, uh, something to sympathize with, to be inspired by that, that vision. Now, probably my favorite single work on Paradise Lost is, uh, is by Stanley Fish. So he, he has a work in, entitled Surprised by Sin. So published in the um, mid 60s or late 60s. Um, so in there, in that uh, book, Fish, uh, kind of accommodate, accommodates or synthesizes both perspectives and makes the ambiguity about Satan part of the design and intention of the poem. So the whole idea is that we are to, according to Fish's thesis, which I think is a very good one, is that we, um, we're sucked into Satan's rhetoric. We, uh, we're, we're, we're sucked into it. Uh, it's the reason that teachers put book one and two on the on, 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 on syllabi and, and, and ask people to read it. It's, it's engaging, Satan is an engaging figure. He, he has a certain, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, even a modern mentality of, 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 a, of a sovereign individual subject with, who, who is kind of like Hamlet, who's, who's, whose mind is, is a space that he can, uh, uh, he can live within and apart from whatever space he occupies in the real world. 
um, and, and that his, his, his mental attitude will, will make a heaven of hell, so to speak. Uh, and then, and, and as I've already mentioned, this figure is contrasted with a very remote God in book three, all part of the temptation. And then, but the process of the reading of the poem, as you see it, as you look at it closely, first of all, and in the ultimate action, we see that this temptation uh, recoils against us. We see it like Adam and Eve in book nine. We see, oh boy, how could we have done that? And, and we have to, like them, go through a process of, of, of learning from that fall, so to speak. So um, uh, a very interesting reading that, that puts the reader, so to speak, into the poem. So that's, I think that's something, the, re the t subtitle of the book, something like that, The Reader in Paradise Lost. So, um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the first lines, but of course the first lines are of man's disobedience, of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree. So, so earlier epics were about of that particular man, okay, of, of, of arms and the man's, this is Virgil. So, which, okay, he means Aeneas. Here of man's first disobedience, it's of humanity's first disobedience, right? It's not of Adam's first disobedience. Um, it's not of Eve's first disobedience. It's of humanity's first disobedience because the, the first part implies that we've been repeatedly doing this all the time. And even as we read it, we're doing it again, right? So the first disobedience is, is, is repeated all the time. Um, so it's humanity doing this disobedience that drift, the disobedience again is, is turning to Satan, is, is drifting away from the divine. Um, now the, uh, the, um, the reader then is, is part of, in this, this reading, the Fish thesis is, is, um, is implicated in that humanity, right? So we are part of the, the heroic story, so to speak. I'll just go back here for a second I'll, to note that uh, I mentioned that Blake, um, when I was talking about William Blake, uh, I for, neglected to mention this is uh, actually a work of William Blake. So he's a poet that also wrote the, these, uh, <clears throat> wrote these uh, visually um, accented, uh, uh, visually orma ornamented works with, with uh, uh, a type of uh, paintings slash etching uh, that, uh, that uh, was very kind of his own unique method, <clears throat> what he calls his infernal method in marriage of heaven and hell. And uh, so this is uh, one, of the, one of those works uh, called Satan Calling Up His Legion. So he's, uh, he's uh, uh, done these, uh, done these uh, visual uh, accompaniments to Paradise Lost, and uh, they're, they're quite stunning. So now at this point, I want to, uh, to talk about uh, Paradise Lost and the epic genre. So we'll talk now about uh, to what extent uh, it fits within the genre of these other great works, and what what that tradition of epic uh, sets up as conventions and sets up expectations for us as readers. Um, so first, uh, just kind of defining epic, uh, I would say a simple definition, a long narrative poem. So what does that mean? I think, you know, long obviously is not short, but, um, but also long in, within the tradition, it's come to have this sense that due to its length and due to it, it can have an encompassing vision, that it can come to be, have an encyclopedic scale of trying to document all the, all the essential elements, let us say, the essential values, the essential stories, the essential themes of a culture uh, or, or, or a nation. So it's, a, uh, it's an all, uh, as I term it here, probably better all-encompassing cultural vision uh, in, in exploring all of the, the most important dimensions of a particular moment of civilization. 
and it's narrative. So it's not lyrical poetry, which is the, usually the exploration of an individual experience without action. Um, so it, it's also not dramatic poetry. So uh, dramatic poetry uh, has a story, uh, but it doesn't have narrative mediation. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So a narrator. So if we think of um, Antony and Cleopatra, which you, which we read, uh, which is a drama, we just have the character speaking there in front of us. So there, we just have a speech tag that says Antony, and then we, we have that person speaking. So narration is when we have a narrator of some sort telling us the story. So, so drama shows, narrative tells. So I'm going to tell you a story about this. So if I were to do a mime or if I were to act it out, then I'm showing you the story. So this is a long narrative poetry, as a long narrative poem, as opposed to a long dramatic poem. That just that that doesn't have narrative mediation. So here the narrator actually has a role. So there's a narrator. We don't know the who this narrator. We don't. The narrator has a narrative voice. So um, uh, and, and it it can it's somewhat akin to the the voice of a Milton in some some ways not. But but we'll point to a couple of key places that um, the narrator. Well, well, we'll have a speech from Satan, for instance, and the narrator's interjection at the end, in a way, can undercut everything that Shakespeare, uh, that, that Satan said. There's maybe a Freudian slip there, with likening Shakespeare and Satan, I don't know. Um, so it's a poem, not prose. So, uh, so it consists of structured lines. So, so, you know, you could have, let's say, War and Peace is a long narrative work. You know, it's narrative, it's narrated, it's long, but it's a long novel. It's made of prose, not poetry. So, so strictly speaking, within the traditional definition, it would not be an epic. So, often the word epic is just generalized to anything big. You know, now it's, it's oh wow, it's really epic. I think people still say that term. You know, like oh, how, what was your weekend? Oh, it was epic. You know, because it was really good or, or really a lot of big things happened. Maybe. So, so in the strict definition of this um, <clears throat> genre, uh, it's a long narrative poem. So on the bottom right, you see a few examples of, of uh, like probably you know, the biggest examples within the tradition that preceded Milton. So, so Milton didn't know about the Epic of Gilgamesh, but it's there. We found it since then, but 2,000 years ago. So, so sorry, like 2000 BCE. So it's 4,000 years ago. So we have, we have these earliest, earliest remnants of writing that we have, of literary writing. So in, in, is, is, are these stories that, that follow this genre? This is kind of long, heroic narrative poems seem to be this almost universal first attempt at, at, at a literary articulation. And of course, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, which we've discussed uh, a, a little bit in connection with Antony and Cleopatra, and Dante's Divine Comedy, which I know I've re re referenced a few times. So Dante's Divine Comedy doesn't, uh, breaks a few of the conventions of, of epic, but it is a long narrative poem. But it, some of the other conventions that we'll talk about, it doesn't follow quite as well. So, um, epic conventions. Um, so conventions, what do I mean? What is a convention? So that's our first question. Okay, so a convention is something that, well, first of all, convention is something that is opposed to what is natural. Right? So something is a convention if it's, a, if it's an agreed upon, hum, let's say human agreement on how we're gonna operate as opposed to a natural, uh, 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 dictated by nature or dictated by rules above beyond a human agreement so to speak so a lot of conventions are can be explicitly agreed upon or they, they're 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 kind of unsaid conventions that have just built up over time now conventions when it comes to um 
art forms. I like to use uh, the example of, uh, of sitcoms where we have certain expectations and um, about what will happen in a sitcom. There's certain conventions. So we, we, we understand that it's going to be lighthearted, that there's, there's going to be short speeches and interactions, and that every, every 30 seconds or so, there's going to be a punchline in those interactions. And we just take that as natural, even though that's not, well, we take that according to the convention as what, as what we expect in that situation. And we, we forget for a moment that that's completely unnatural. People don't speak that way, right? So, so that's fine. And then um, uh, we also expect that it will last you know, only 22 minutes. There'll be some sort of crisis or conflict. It will be resolved uh, and neat and tidy. And there's not going to be necessarily a, a connection to the next episode that we watch of that. That'll be a totally different episode. Okay, so it's episodic. It doesn't have a long narrative arc between the different uh, installments. Um, so those are a few, let's say, conventions. And then limericks, you know, you, that's a, another, let's say, art form. They have five lines <clears throat> and, you know, five lines. And, you know, there's a convention that it's going to have certain rhyme, you know, A, uh, and then there's B, B, uh, sorry, A, A, B, B, C. And that uh, there's, uh, the last line will probably rhyme with Nantucket and it's going to be lewd and crude or something like that. So that's a convention of what you would expect out of that kind of limerick. Um, so, so too with epic, there's the, the set of the expectations and conventions. Okay. So in medias res is one of these, so beginning in the middle of things. And, um, and then we have the recounting backwards and the forecasting forward. In, in Homer's Odyssey, for instance, <clears throat> so if you've read that, Odysseus ends up uh, uh, narrating, so probably the most famous part of the Odyssey, when people say, oh yeah, the Odyssey, where he goes here, here, that's really him recounting. So it's kind of two narrative removes away. Uh, it's him recounting things that had happened before the, the action of the epic proper, so to speak. So his journey with the cycla, Cyclopes, the... Uh, journey to the underworld, all these things are recounted in books 9 to 12 to the Phaeacians. And then um, Virgil's Aeneid, similarly, he narrates his journey, so this is pattern on, on Odysseus, to the Carthaginians. Remember, the Carthaginians are the, the queen is Dido, and so he's, he's on Carthage there. He's narrating his journey. One of the hero, hero, listeners is Dido, the queen, and she's falling in love with him as, as he narrates these um, these events and then as I mentioned in book four they actually get together in a cave and and she she takes it as them being married and and uh, and the rest is history so to speak um, Milton's Paradise Lost as I mentioned uh, Raphael narrates to Adam and Eve in book five to eight the cosmic history so is think of the scope as bigger. Everything Milton is doing here is he takes that convention. He's following the convention, but he's saying everyone who's writing in that tradition, the, the, the classical authors in that tradition, Homer and Virgil, are writing within a pagan tradition that had a limited vision. They can be prophets for their small, the small scope that they had, but he will go with no middle flight, he says at the beginning. His will be no middle flight. It, he's privy to Christian revelation that enables to, him to, if inspired properly, to, to be able to tell the story of all things from the beginning to the end. This, to tell of the most, the, most, the, the highest uh, uh, battles that can be waged of, for one's soul of good and versus evil, uh, as opposed to these other journeys and battles that were were described in the past. <clears throat> Another invocation uh, convention is this epic invocation. So invoking or calling for the aid of the muse. So the muse is a semi-divine figure that, that can inspire the poet with, with knowledge, with, with an ability to sing. So you know, poetry originally in, in, in the form of song and 
to to you know to to sing like rather than just normal prosaic language the story that they would not otherwise be able to say okay so this is part of this epic tradition is to have to start with an epic in invocation this is from uh, the odyssey sing to me of the man so odysseus muse the man of twists and turns uh driven time and again off course once he had plundered the hallowed heights of troy many cities of men he saw and learned their mind many pains he suffered heart sick on the open sea fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home then every god took pity all except poseidon he raged on seething against the great odysseus till he reached his native land so we get at the beginning an, an, an invocation we also get uh, the subject uh, so the subject will be in this case uh, the, the the man of twists and turns so so uh, the, man, the the person of many turnings is Odysseus who can will, who can be deceptive is wily so to speak but also in the sense of he's had to he's had the journey and, and, and has had to uh, come up against these different challenges so we have help me muse we have a subject we have um uh, this the uh this kind of a, a bit of the situation and a reference to the cause of the troubles and it's usually a deity who is against the hero in this case it's poseidon who is against odysseus in in the case of the aeneid it's juno who uh who always pre prevents aeneas from getting to his end uh, goal in, in, in the Iliad the, the cause of the the, the stirring was Apollo okay <clears throat> so I've tried to structure that out here so for, for Paradise Lost <clears throat> the subject is of, of humanity's first disobedience and the fruit which brought so what's the situation of that subject well it brought humanity to a fall whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woes so all of the fact that our lives can be full of filled with woe is due to this humanity's con first and continuing disobedience our first and continuing turning away from the divine and the cause of this so he says say first what cause moved our grandparents the internal serpent the infernal serpent he it was so satan okay and uh, I won't go through this, but this is kind of the, uh, the Coles Notes version of that structure in the first lines of the other epics. So in the Iliad, in the Iliad, it's it's of the wrath of Achilles. Odyssey, it's the man of many turns. Odysseus, Aeneid, the arms and the man Aeneas, <clears throat> and Paradise Lost. We just talked about other convention. Oh, actually, let's. I wanted to take take that as a as a point. To, to look at the first lines. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll begin with those first lines. Um, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me, for thou knowest, thou from the first wast present and with mighty wings outspread dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss and madest it pregnant 
What in me is dark, illumine? What is low raise and support? That to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. So a very famous first 26 lines. Um, just unpack a bit of that. First of all, the, the poem is um, so so dense, you know, it's so uh, so much going on in it. Uh, whole courses, you know, people spend whole courses, full year courses, studying just the poem, you know, and, and, and feel, you know, there's not enough time. And there's, in fact, there's these old jokes where profs would say, uh, you know, we're, we're halfway through the term and we're still on the first 26 lines, you know, and then the, the other prof came back, and this is kind of a legendary story, the other prof came back and said, you know, yeah, well, we, we're still on the first line, you know, we, we haven't figured out if we've exhausted the of man's part yet, you know, so what is all this stuff to unpack here? Um, so, so it's incredibly rich, and we won't be able to go through all of it, but let's try to pick some highlights there. So, of of man's first disobedience and the fruit. So the fruit in the first instance here in the line is you know, refers to, let's say, in our first, as you read it, first meaning is of, 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 of the first disobedience, let's say, and the fruit. Okay, so the subject is our disobedience and fruit in the sense of the effects. So the fruit so our first disobedience and the effects of that disobedience is the subject, okay? And definitely that's true. But in the next line, modifies fruit, and this is part of, of, of Milton's verse. This is part, part of Milton's epic verse that is so, um, uh, so appealing, is, is that the, there's an ongoing modification of what's happening in the last previous, the last of the previous line by the next words of, of the following line. So, and the fruit of that forbidden tree. So there's the fruit in the sense of the effect of the disobedience, but the subject is also of the, the forbidden tree and its fruit. Okay, so why? So knowledge, the knowledge of good, of good and evil is also part of the subject. Whose mortal taste brought, all, brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, so with loss of paradise that we were describing, to one greater man, so one greater uh, man in this case being a, a reference to Christ, who uh, the Son, so an aspect of, of, of God's divinity, a certain aspect of God's divinity, becomes human, becomes man, becomes flesh, according to the, uh, uh, the Christian telling, and uh, restores us through uh, through his sacrifice of himself. Okay, and oh yeah, so we talked about that story. We talked about that in, when we talked about the dream of the root, right? We talked about the crucifixion story. <clears throat> um, sing heavenly muse. So uh, here, muse is delayed. So remember the other one. So of arms of, and the man sing. You know, so there the the muse or sing muse part has been delayed to line six compared to the previous epics um that on the top secret on the secret top of oreb so um or horeb is another way or of sinai so these two mounts uh, ac uh according to different excerpts in the hebrew bible um where moses received uh a, a divine inspiration and the divine presencing as well as the divine law, law the divinely instituted commandments the ten commandments so um, um, that in one way he's asking for the same type of inspiration that came to Moses uh, and that established a law for for the Hebrew people uh, for for uh, thousands of years um, did inspire that shepherd Moses who first taught the chosen seed the, the Hebrew people in the uh, in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos so so his inspiration in addition to the law he but he was also inspired to write according to according to traditional understanding until about the, the, the late 18th century Moses wrote the first five books of the of the Hebrew Bible, the Pentateuch. 
So he was inspired to write these books. He, he was inspired, he wasn't there, but he was inspired to know what happened in the beginning, which is the first lines of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos, or if Sion Hill. So there, so that's the inspiration, we have the mosaic inspiration that gave us the Torah, the Pentateuch. So the Torah is the first five books. The, the Torah, the law. We also have, or if Sion Hill, so Zion, so it's a hill in um, uh, hill in Jerusalem, uh, that uh, Isaiah refers to as a as a source of of divine inspiration. So so here uh, the the inspiration can be akin to the inspiration that gave Hebrew law or Hebrew prophecy. Okay, delight thee more. And Siloah's brook uh, attached to Zion, fast by the oracle of God. I thence invoke my a thy age to my adventurous song. Okay, that so this is an adventurous song that 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 is is attempting things as we say as we see later. You know that, that um, unattempted uh, before in in prose or rhyme. Um, that with no middle flight. So before we would have. Uh, uh, Poetic inspiration from Mount Parnassus, so these other um, these other pagan, uh, in, you know, in, uh, home of the muses for the ancient Greeks. But these are middle mounts compared to these other higher uh, sources of inspiration that have their uh, um, ins inspiration from what, what, according to Milton, is a higher truth. And chiefly, thou, O spirit that dust prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. So, so uh, the, the Holy Spirit that was there and dove-like sats brooding on the vast abyss uh, uh, during creation and made it preg pregnant. So too, as you were there to, out of chaos and out of darkness, create the whole universe, so to create this universe that I will describe in poetry out of my darkness, my blindness. It was one way of reading that. And so that I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Um, so there is um, the, uh, this notion that um, uh, the poem is about telling the story of all things in order to justify the ways of God to men. So this is a term for this is a theodicy. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, change our screen here to, uh, so I can use the whiteboard to type this term out. So justifying the ways of God to men, is another way of saying this is, it's a theodicy. So the, uh, the components of that are, uh, those terms are, are Greek, which is theos equals God, you know, and then DK equals justice from Greek, okay? Well, theodicy is to see the justice in God or, or to, to justify, figure out the rightness of God's action. So, so a theodicy is, is something that explains how, why is there evil in the world? So why conceptually can we get our head around that God would allow evil in, in, in the world? So, so, so the poem, in addition to being a great story, wants to do these things as well. It wants to, it wants to be this sort of, highlighting of the justice, the eternal providence behind what seems like a fall uh, or us suffering bec because we've turned to evil, those types of things, okay? So um, I'll just continue here. Uh, so we get a, sent a little bit more sense of the poem. Say first, <clears throat> um, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell. Say first what cause moved our, uh, our grandparents in that happy state, favored of heaven so highly, to fall off from their creator and transgress his will. 
for one restraint, lords of the world besides. Who first seduced them in that foul revolt? The infernal serpent, he it was, whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind. What time is pride had cast him out from heaven? with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the Most High, if he opposed and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God, raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. So I'll just uh, highlight that. So, so what we see in one of the things to look for if we think of Milton's Republican perspective is, is one view um, is, is to see Milton as this almost, sorry, Satan as like a Republican against this imperial enthroned power of God. But another way, if you, you can see, you can see a lot of traces of the real kind of pomp and luxury and pride and, and everything that's associated with, with one person wanting to set, set themselves in glory above others like a king or like an emperor is Satan himself. So it's, it's basically this, his uh, usurpation was, was an attempt to take, um, take that, uh, that, that kind of position. And he does so, uh, I'll just flag a couple words here, he raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. Remember that word vain we talked about. So vain, having both senses more present of the both senses, both meanings of that word more present at the time in the Renaissance than we do today. So vain in the sense of of uh, of proud uh, and vain in the sense of useless. So it was a proud attempt, but it was also a useless attempt. Him, the almighty uh, power, hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion down, to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire, who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew, lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. Just the, the, the alliteration, I just want to point to, to the, um, the alliteration there the, of the, uh, he with his horrid crew, uh, uh, it makes you want to spit because you're dry. <laughs> you're dry in the, in the flames of, um, of hell there. But his doom reserved him to more wrath, for now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay, mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast haste. At once, as far as angels can he views, the dismal situation waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light but rather darkness visible served only to discover sights of woe. I'll just pause there for a second uh, and highlight that, uh, that, that line about uh, both lost happiness, and this is part of what makes the experience of being fallen. So we see in Satan the experience of being fallen, and we see it again with, with, um, with Adam and Eve. So in, in, in Adam, in Satan, we see the experience of being fallen without hope, and um, and to be fallen without hope. Uh, well, to be fallen, period. Is part of this is uh, experience is the experience of lost happiness and lasting pain, and the torment uh, of of that contradiction of knowing that they had this and they turned away and and seeing ahead of oneself no hope so maybe again to think about this is uh, again a kind of a an allegorical depiction of sorts of of what is really a spiritual or psychological experience of oneself so maybe one's been a very dark time themselves and they see 
I see no way out of it. They see, I used to be happy, but I see no way out right now. This, and that's part of the torment. And what ends up saving Adam and Eve at the end is, is, is seeing a form of hope. They have to find that hope again. Okay. Um, so there's that. And then I want to highlight darkness visible as, as kind of an epigram for, for the depiction of hell in books one and two. He, um, Satan, sorry, Milton is able in his, in this poem to make the darkness that the experience of evil, the experience of being turned away from the divine visible and come to light for us in the story and in the description, okay? Um, and, and just that, that, that paradoxical image of darkness visible. Uh, there's a book on, on depression on that that came out recently, on darkness visible as the experience of that depression, let's say. Hmm. So that darkness visible, the flames that are coming from, from the, the burning lake this, this uh, served only to discover sites of woe. So it's not as though this is a, it's providing a nice warm candlelight to, 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 <laughs> to provide a nice nuanced, a nuanced uh, ambiance. This is only discovering sites of woe and, and gives off really no light. Um, regions of sorrow, doleful shades where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all. So that's um, a reference to Dante, um, to Dante's Inferno, where uh, uh, is inscribed over the gates of hell, all hope abandon ye who enter here. So I believe is how it goes. All, uh, abandon all hope ye who enter here, something like that. So that's in, Inferno Canto 3, I believe. Um, so hell is this place of being fallen without hope, okay? And then Adam and Eve will have to find that hope. Um, and, and part in, in, in kind of the Pauline description of the Christian virtues, you know, faith, hope, charity, the Christian virtue of hope is what can be lost if, we're, if we do transgress or fall, you know, is, is, is that is the despair and say, well, there's no, no, there's no point. So seeing hope, seeing that this is part of uh, maybe a, maybe seeing this, whatever tribulation one's going through as part of a divinely ordained or providential design is part of the education of the poem. Is to say there is hope. You know, you can be, uh, find yourself uh, fallen like Adam and Eve and, and under this way of Satan and, and maybe you feel that, that you're, 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 world is as dark as as the hell that's described here but there is hope that's the difference okay and we and the poems the reminder of that um let's see um that comes to all but torture without end still urges and a fiery deluge fed with ever ever burning sulfur unconsumed such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious here their prison ordained in utter darkness and their portion set. Uh, as far removed from God and light of heaven as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell. There the companions of this fall overwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire he soon discerns. So he sees, so Satan's there wallowing in this burning lake. And this, uh, the narrator's mentioning how this is so unlike uh, the place from whence he fall. And he's casting around his eyes and he sees others that are also wallowing in this, in this lake. He soon discerns uh, uh, and weltering by his side, one next himself in power and next in crime, long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub to whom the arch enemy and fence in heaven called Satan with bold words, breaking the horrid silence thus began. So I'll stop there and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get to his speech later. But um, Beelzebub is his kind of 
number one person there is a is a is a devil it in literally means lord of the flies so maybe maybe some of you read that novel by william golding lord of the flies it refers to beelzebub um and he uh is satan's number two so to speak in uh, throughout the um the poem So we were looking at some of these epic conventions, and one of the epic conventions was the opening. Um, other epic conventions uh, of the earlier ones are catabasis, so a journey to the underworld. So catabasis is kind of a down, a, a down going or a downward journey, and a journey to the underworld. We see that in the Odyssey. We see that in the the Aeneid. Uh, so both of the major characters, the heroes, descend to the underworld. Here we present, we're presented with the underworld right off the bat in, in books one and two. We get glimpses of it again in book ten. But, um, uh, and the descent into the underworld, where we could say that the heroic uh, figures in the previous epics, the main characters, the heroic figures who undertake action, are the ones who descend, they learn something and they ascend. So um, by that pattern, Satan is our uh, epic hero who, who descends, he, he had battles apparently, he, he, he ascended again to try to conquer the world, is, is successful. Um, uh, but there's a twist here, you know, he's, there's a lot of question marks around, as I said, Satan is epic hero, uh, does he really change? He, he ends up having to return with less power than ever, we'll see. Uh, um, uh, so, so all that to say, one of the uh, one of the conventions that is in a way echoed here, but but transformed, a numeratio, so a, an epic list, so an enumeration of a long long catalog or, or, or a genealogy. So, so um, in the Iliad, there's the the catalog of the ships that sailed from Greece, a thousand ships. So. So they don't mention every one, but they say, oh, there's so-and-so, the, the ships that came from Ithaca or wherever. And, um, and on them were, were figures such as these people. Here we have, uh, and I won't go through it, but to see an example of the epic list at work in, 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 um, in Milton, the, the, the catalog of the fallen angels as they raised themselves. Remember the, the part we just read? The narrator is describing the opening scene, which is a burning lake in hell. And Satan has just fallen there and, and is rousing himself. And then he's turning to Beelzebub, and then they'll have some speeches. And he then, re he then says, okay, let's get out of this lake at least, you know, and go over that dry land and try to rest, or rest a little bit. If rest can be found, that's the thing. You can't find any rest in hell. It's not any better over there. So he comes out and, and, and gives this stirring speech to rouse the troops, get out, you know, or, or be forever fallen, you know, rouse yourselves. And as they, they mount out of the lake, all these fallen angels who, who, who were in the lake and are now rousing themselves from Satan's speech, he, um, they, the narrator goes through and catalogs uh, a number of them. And this is the Milton's example of that convention of the of the enumeration, the elect, uh, epic list, the epic simile. Remember, epics are everything's bigger. Everything it's the story of everything. So um, a normal simile, you know, is is uh, I've got an example here. Lyrics would give us love is like a red rose. So that's you know pretty simple. It's using like or as in order to make a comparison. That's a simile, and it works, and, it's, and everyone's happy. An epic simile has to go further and, and, and draw in uh, through the, the description uh, an almost encyclopedic gathering of what that image entails. And you, the, the epic simile becomes a rich way of, in the work of, of, for the narrator, the poetic voice to draw out even more let's say, what the readers to take, the intent, the message behind the work. So, and this is just something I made up for comparative purposes. So the, instead of just love is like a rose that lyric would give us, epic would give us something like, um, 
as the roses that bloom on the sides of that hill where the great philosopher would oft walk while discoursing on free will and not for long forgetting that high calling of a preordained root, etc., etc., etc. So love blossomed in her in the seeing of that sight of blah, 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 blah. So, um, so as the roses, just as those roses that bloom uh, on that hill. Okay, so that's enough. You can say that would be the simile. So just like a rose that blooms on the hill, so was their love. Okay, that would be, but being epic, it's going to draw in others which bloomed on the hill of philosophy that this philosopher is on. So I, that was just one I made up, but, but okay, well, what does that mean then? Okay, so, so the love is somehow tied in this instance to that, that philosopher talking about free will or something like that. So, so this is what happens in these epic similes is it becomes much more rich interpretively uh, and, and, and can lead down multiple paths. So I'm going to go very quickly over these. So, so I want to give a sense. So we know in the, in the background lines what's going on in the major epics that are before Milton. So as I said, Milton didn't know about this, but our record, first literary work preserved is the Epic of Gilgamesh, and he's a king of Uruk, um, and he's uh, part human, part God, supernaturally strong. And uh, another god creates this wild man, Enkidu. Uh, they, they're challenged at first, but they become friends. And Enkidu dies. And, and then there's this question of mortality. And they have one thing I would say that, that kind of unites the epics is this sense of trying to find a meaning uh, to life in the face of mortality. Here, you know, that here the, the fruit caused it was the cause of that brought us death and all our woe okay so it brought us a certain mortality as life removed from god um but so too in, in epic of gilgamesh it's facing human mortality and what's the meaning of existence in the face of that mortality so gilgamesh grieves and he tries to find the secret of immortality how, how can i become immortal and uh he he goes through long journeys and is ultimately discovers he's powerless in the face of death in the passage of time and and his response he he, he and i think i mentioned this in relation to the sonnets uh his response is is to say okay well let's build the walls of Uruk, and that will be my lasting legacy so that's a response to mortality and transience uh so the iliad so too there so we have the iliad also kind of a, a in a way you know a, looking at life and mortality and what makes makes it have meaning is is uh it's questionable what the answer is there but uh, you know achilles choice there is is fame and doing honorable things we are just he has a final speech there we're just playthings of the gods of, of zeus and and you know it, it, it's just suffering and, and what all we can do is kind of go out in a blaze of glory and have glory that lasts after us so play us free play us so this is the background of the Iliad, is the judgment of, of Paris, and we'll go into this. And, and the Iliad talks about, uh, goes over the story of the anger of Achilles. Um, he, he withdraws from the fighting because he, he, he feels his honor has been robbed because that Agamemnon took his, Agamemnon's the leader of the Greek forces that are, that are sieging Troy. And uh, he took his prize, his war prize, Briseis, and um, <clears throat> Achilles withdraws from the fighting, and that's tough because Greek uh, Achilles is the greatest warrior. He's a he's a pretty tough dude, and he's um, uh, because of that, uh, his uh, the Greeks are suffering losses. His friend Pat Patroclus dies at the hands of the Trojan hero Hector, and uh, uh, Achilles goes into an absolute paroxysm of of rage and wants to to revenge this and finally slays Hector in, in single combat. And uh, Priam, Hector's father, sneaks into the Greek camp to beg for the return of, of Hector's body, which, which uh, Achilles had been dragging around on this, um, at the end of his chariot. And they'd had these war games afterwards and, and Hector's body was being you know, disabused uh, the whole time. So he begs for his body in return so that he can be properly buried. And it's very important for the, sh the shade, the spirit of, of Hector in the afterlife to be buried as such. 
This is just the, the site of Troy, later discovered it's in the 19th century, I think, by Schliemann, if, if I'm remembering correctly, as, uh, as the, the site of it is, uh, the historical site of these, these, uh, these legendary stories, but there was probably some sort of war there in, uh, around 1184. So the Odyssey, uh, again, very quickly, first few books, uh, often called the Telemachia, focus on the problems uh, caused at home by, by Odysseus's long absence. And here we meet um, Odysseus's son. And then book five, we finally meet Odysseus. And um, he is, is uh, near the end of his travels, longing for home. And uh, he's, he's under the kind of sway of a powerful nymph. Calypso, who offers him immortality, he refuses. So again, he, for, for, for Odysseus, he said uh, that the kind of the wisdom is his, um, his uh, wisdom is this notion that he knows that immortality isn't proper for humans. Okay. And he says he'd rather return to, just wants to return to the hearts of Ithaca. And he's been there for seven years. Uh, and finally, Hermes arrives to convince her to let him leave. Um, and then books, uh, books uh, six to eight narrate Odysseus is finally getting to the Phaeacians. And then books nine to 12, I've mentioned this before, the Phaeacians, he, he tells that story to the Phaeacians about his adventures. And then books 13 to 24, so the second half of the book are, are about him back in Ithaca. Uh, with, uh, he and uh, uh, dispensing with the, the, the hundred suitors there that, that ha were trying to uh, uh, take over his, uh, his, his, his land and, and his wife. And uh, after dispatching them, he's, he's reunited with his wife and his, his son, who we'd left as an infant. So Virgil's Aeneid, books one to six, uh, is, the, is kind of the Odyssean half, uh, recounting Aeneas's travels from from the fall of Troy to making landfall in Italy. And then books seven to 12 are kind of an Iliadic half, recounting a, a, a war of, of Aeneas's Trojan followers with the Latin inhabitants of Italy. And he finally slays his Latin foe Turnus and, and it parallels the end of the Iliad there where Hector is slain by, by Achilles. So, so those are kind of in the background. So those are the, the basically the out, outline of the, of the major epics in the background, and Milton sets himself the task of outdoing these these epics within the tradition, uh, and, and he can soar higher, as I think I've mentioned, uh, because he has the benefit of Christian uh, revelation, and his muse can aid him in his adventurous song that, with no middle flight, intends to soar above the Aeonian Mount, so above the mounts of of pagan inspiration in Greece. So Northrop Fry, for, for this reason, calls it the story of all things. And, and we can contrast the scope of this, let's say, with, or, 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 or epic in general, uh, as a literary possibility for Milton uh, to just a short time later. So this Milton's writing, to, let's say, when, when maybe epic is maybe still kind of possible. It's not really possible, I don't think, today to write an epic such as this, that like an all-encompassing uh, meta narrative that tries to unite uh, culture and say this is our defining story. People don't buy it, and um, and uh, we, we see the scope. Let's say we can contrast that almost quantitatively, and this is a let's say the condensation of story time in in modern novels. So progressively, the time. So let's think of narrative as our our capacity to to take together disparate events in time and give them a certain unit, unity, a certain stamp and say, this is one, this has an organic whole to it, but there's a beginning, a middle and an end, even though, even though it may have seemed disparate. Um, so, so novels, which are in this, the, are, the, are the graphic elements in this slide, uh, are our modern form. So rather than long narrative poetry, people read novels now for the most part. So, uh, so um, a novel started probably with Robinson Crusoe, uh, probably the first novel. 
And this study is a great study by this um, academic in the States, Ted Underwood, who uh, I've co corresponded with a bit and, 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 and chatted with him, doing a lot of great, great stuff. Um, so this study came out just a couple of years ago on, on, on why literary time is measured in minutes. So this is an example of what I had mentioned at the beginning of the course of kind of taking a computational or quantitative approach to literary work. So, so he had a, a research team go through and, and take random samples of, uh, in, in 16 different spots of a novel, read 250 words uh, in that random spot, and kind of assign how much story time was described. So did that describe a day, that one page? Did it describe four minutes of story? Okay, so if the, the page said, I woke up that morning, I brushed my teeth, and then, and then by the time I got to work, blah, blah, blah. So that, you know, so that's describing maybe an hour, you know, uh, getting up and then getting to work, okay? So the coders did that and they, they tabulated multiple coders for each work and they came up with uh, an average uh, for each of these works over the time that they're published. So you see works published in the early 18th century, on average, a page of text would describe maybe a week, maybe a month of time. It's the other thing I want to point out about the graph is it's a logarithmic scale, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's descending exponentially there. Uh, the, the actual, um, the actual, let's say time represented on the page is descending quite a bit in terms of as we get to more and more modern modern novels. Uh, so now, you know, in the, the 20th century and, and even uh, today, um, uh, a page is, is representing maybe on average, uh, you know, between 15 minutes and an hour, um, uh, as opposed to a week or a month. Now, and then in extreme versions of that, you get, uh, I highlighted Mrs. Dalloway as an example of, so that's a, a Virginia Woolf's novel, a kind of stream of consciousness um, novel, one of the modern works uh, in that genre. Uh, so we, in extreme examples of that, you get novels that are fixated just on interior thoughts that are only a few minutes, you know, a few minutes, uh, or if that, you know, a, Pages can go on about, you know, just a few minutes of interior thought. So rather than narrative that's bringing together social sweeping movements over time, or, or, or in Milton's case, cosmic movements, the ex increasingly we, we have micro narratives that can only bring together a moment or an impression of something. Um, so I don't want to make too much of that, but I, I think we, we need to contrast epic scope, like what, what, what was available to an Iliad or a, a, a Homer who could, could talk about the whole cosmos and from beginning to end and, and what we feel art can depict now or what a novel, a literary work can depict in its, its narrative. So Milton's verse, um, uh, I'm going to, there's a section at the beginning uh, there where he describes his verse. We're going to turn to that. Uh, it's, it's in the front matter there. You see it, the, see the verse in the front matter to the poem. And, and I just want to highlight, so he's, he's establishing there that he's following certain conventions, including the conventions of the classical authors of not having uh, end rhymes on the line. So it's known as free verse or non-rhyming verse. And Milton highlights this as an ancient liberty. So let's find that uh, uh, if I can. Yeah, so this is the verse. So this precedes um, the, um, precedes the beginning of, uh, of Paradise Lost that we just read. The measure is English heroic verse, without rhyme, as that of Homer in Greek and Virgil in Latin, rhyme being no necessary adjunct or true owner ornament of poem or good, board, uh, or good verse, in longer works especially, but the invention of a barbarous age to set off wretched matter and lame meter. 
graced indeed since by the use of some famous modern poet. So some modern poets are doing it too, and maybe they're a bit better at the rhyming, but I disagree with it. So I think he's kind of referring there to John Dryden, a contemporary poet who I didn't put on the course because I agree with Milton. He's not quite as good as, as Milton himself. Uh, carried away by custom, but much to their own vexation, hindrance and constraint to express many things otherwise. And for the most part, worse than else they would have expressed them. Not without cause, therefore, have uh, some, some both Italian and Spanish poets of prime note have rejected rhyme both in longer and shorter works, as have also long since our best English tragedies. So, um, so the English tragedies written in the Elizabethan age, so even uh, uh, Thomas Kidd's uh, the Spanish tragedy was, uh, was an early one, and, and the, uh, of course, Shakespeare's tragedy, tra Tragedies all, all written in, in all, all the drama written in free verse. As a thing of itself to all judicious ears, trivial and by no true musical delight, which consists only in apt numbers, fit quantity of syllables, and the sense of variously drawn out from one verse unto another. Remember I talked about how fruit has a sense that goes on to the second line and is modified. That's what I think what he means here by variously drawn out, sense variously drawn out from one line to the other. And he's saying that this has, so app numbers, so the meter, the quantity of syllables and, and, um, uh, and the sense drawn out. These are more poetic than the, the jingling of rhyme, he said. Uh, oh yeah, right here, not in the jingling sound of like endings, a fault avoided by the learned ancients in poetry and all good oratory. This neglect then of rhyme, so little is to be taken for a defect, though it may seem so, perhaps to vulgar readers, that it rather is to be esteemed an example set, the first in English, of, of ancient liberty recovered, to heroic poem from the troublesome and modern bondage of rhyming. So, uh, couple of things there. First of all, ancient liberty. Um, remember uh, uh, his, his Republican leanings are about, about recovering a classical notion of liberty. Um, I mean, it's important, this kind of notion of rational liberty is an important theme of, of, of Paradise Lost. So um, I'm going to quickly go over this notion of the conventions itself, the ones I just talked about, is he's, he's following these conventions, but in a sense that's recovering, like the following the convention of not of, of free verse, is, is recovering an ancient liberty. It may seem that, well, wouldn't it be easier for him to express himself if he didn't have to follow the patterns of in medias res and, and this and that and those structures, uh, but the conventions are liberating. Um, and I think the, and this is the point I want to get across, the sense that um, uh, I think it's beginning with the Romantics that somehow to um, uh, a poet needs to be free to invent their own forms and not be constrained by previous forms. So they created their own idiosyncratic forms, um, and and I think it's it's building on a kind of a modern conception of the world where we can or a modern notion of liberty that we can do liberty or freedom as free from external constraints. Whereas, I remember we talked about this, we were talking about this, I think, in connection with Spencer's um, Sonnet 67, where, you know, I, was, I think I was talking there about, about how uh, she was, the, the, the deer was goodly one by her own will uh, beguiled, you know, so she was, so she's, she, there's a certain liberty uh, in that poem that both lovers gain by tying one another to themselves. So the binding, the constraint, is a liberation that enables them to grow to their proper ends, okay? And I had the example of the tomato steak, the tomato plant, right? The tomato plant, if free without constraint, languishes and dies, but it's only with constraint that it can blossom to its end, so to speak. So for the classical tradition is that notion up to, and I would say up to and in Milton, including Milton and Pope, freedom is a matter of being free to fulfill one's end. So because the genre has a rich tradition, the poet kind of adhering to that, that form and convention 
and, and references to previous works frees the poet to express more, more easily. It, it gives them the strength to express with what would take more lines to develop and stuff like that. They can do in passing reference something very quickly. That gives them the strength, it, just like the tomato stink gives the, the tomato plank the strength to grow and express itself in the fruit. So to Milton, by relying on the tradition, can refer to it and build on its strength and, and to, to set forth his own message. Um, and, and here's one of my favorite examples. I'll try to go through this quickly. So, so Milton, uh, his, his uh, epic invocation at the beginning of the poem calls to, calls to mind these other invocations. We already mentioned that. But his ep use of the simile, uh, epic simile, points to earlier examples. And one of my favorite is the, the reference to the fallen angels as they're, as they're lying there in the burning lake. Remember how I mentioned they're, they're lying there. Satan tries to rouse them up. Satan stood and called his legions, angel forms who lay entranced, thick as autumnal leaves that strow the brooks of Valambrosa, where the Etrurian shades high overarched in bower. So he's got this simile comparing the, the, uh, the leaves, uh, sorry, the, 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 the fallen angels to leaves lying on the, floating on the top of this river, which calls to mind. Immediately, it calls to mind for those of you who read Inferno, the Inferno, uh, Dante, uh, Dante's comparison of dead souls falling into the river Acheron to fallen leaves. So in this line, as in the autumn, leaves doth detach themselves first one and then the other, till the bough sees all its fallen garments on the ground. Similarly, the evil seed of Adam descended from the shoreline one by one when signaled as a falcon called will come. Which also echoes uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Okay, so uh, Aeneas is, is in book six, he's descending to the underworld. Remember I talked about that, that catabasis, that journey to the underworld, which we see in these epics. So, so uh, Aeneas is, is there, he's, he's waiting for the boatman Caron, and the narrator says, thick as the leaves in autumn strow the woods or fowls by winter forced, forsake the floods and wing their hasty flight to happier lands, such and so thick the sh shivering army stands and press for passage with extended hands. So all the souls on the, uh, on the, um, on the shore waiting for the boatmen are like those leaves which also echoes, of course, we go back again, of course, Homer, uh, his description of Glaucus, defiant words to the threatening Diomedes. So this is a little different, so these are not, uh, they're not in, in, in the underworld, but again, leaves are uh, on a river, uh, uh, and, and the generations of humans are like that. Generations of men are like the leaves in winter, winds blow them down to earth, but then, when spring season comes again, the budding wood grows more. And so with men, one generation grows, another dies away. And finally, you know, so there's, we've got this, you know, from Homer to Virgil to Dante to Milton. And then Eliot, like uh, T.S. Eliot, a 20th century poet, wants to build on that tradition. And uh, he's He's able to do this again, like Milton, in just a few lines because he wants to say that this is a continuing tradition. So he's able to try to re rekindle this lost tradition with references to, to myriad literary works in the wasteland. And sure enough, he does this in the using leaves you, and comparing the, the dead to numberless leaves. He's talking about he's talking about the Thames, he's talking about soulless people marching to work and uh, and a, a proud flowed over London Bridge, so many I had not thought death had undone so many. So that's a direct reference to uh, Dante. The river's tent is broken, the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. So the leaves there are, um, are likened to these, these, this crowd of people who are just marching off to work, but he's already compared them to dead souls in, uh, in, um, in, 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 the underworld in, in hell, in the inferno, uh, that's a reference to Dante, and, and then compares them a bit later to, to the river's tent is broken, the last fingers of leaf, so they're like leaves on the, 
on the uh, on the, that river. I'm going to stop this part of the lecture now. So we've had a good introduction to the epic background to Milton's Paradise Lost. We've had a bit of an indication of of what's going on with uh, the, the, the setup of Satan at the beginning through the invocation in the first 80 lines or so with, with, with the narrator's description of, of where they are. Uh, we've talked about how Milton's building on the epic conventions of the past, notably Homer and Virgil. And uh, in, uh, in the second part, uh, of this lecture. I'm going to go into books one uh, and notably Satan there, a bit more depth there, what, what makes him so appealing, and then and quickly over book two, uh, looking at the consultation in hell. Thank you very much.